Hello, this is Eric Tinkler here and Dr. Payne with Not Your Forte. This week we're going to be talking a little bit about music theory and I'm thinking that discussion should be at least in theory pretty fun and interesting. No pun intended, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, just a little bit about us if you haven't heard us yet. Uh, this is Not Your Forte podcast. We're kind of, we're aimed towards helping music education students uh, get through college, understand things a little bit better, provide both help with uh, coursework, help with professional help, like building resumes and stuff like that, and just some kind of general advice. Um, this is episode two. If you haven't listened to episode one, you can find that on like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, tons of different places. Um, but going in, uh, later on in the episode, we're going to have uh, Dr. Alyssa Morris be our first guest on the pod. We're very excited. She's a, She teaches theory and oboe here. She'll tell you a little bit more about herself later. Um, but starting off, uh, Dr. Payne, how, how's your last couple of weeks been? It's been wild. It's been fast. It's been furious. Um, I spent last week at a music teacher education conference. So I um, got together with uh, friends and colleagues from across the country, and we discussed everything from um, you know teaching episodes to uh, apprenticeships to internships to mental health of music education majors. Um, that that's a really big topic right now, and and probably one that we will have an episode coming up about, uh, oh, yeah. because uh, the reality is is you know you talked about uh, working through a lot of the issues that we face as music education majors. Um, it really is navigating a minefield. It's understanding, uh, and really it's an awareness of who you are and your own self and what your limitations are. And, and so I think uh, that was a really big uh, focus of this uh, conference that I was at. And it seems that that's becoming more and more of interest to researchers, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be fantastic for the students. Yeah, um, it's really cool uh, just as a student to see that this has become such a large uh, emphasis and focus, not just in music, but in tons of education fields of like, of uh, focusing on the mental health of students and mm -hmm. it's it's i see so many friends or myself struggle with a lot of it so it's really cool to see that they're actively doing things absolutely and and so that's that's really exciting to see what other people are studying what they're looking at and it gives us a new uh, a new outlook you know uh just as you know everybody hits those like uh, mid-semester doldrums as students the, the professors are going through the same thing. And so a conference like this really reinvigorates us. Mm -hmm. not, that, not that we're not motivated, but it's, it reinvigorates us to come in and try new things. Um, so just a couple of things that are happening here uh, just within the last two weeks. Uh, so I did a, a fellowship this summer in New Jersey uh, that was called the Modern Band Fellowship, and it's uh, incorporating modern band and popular music principles within uh, the music education classroom. And so we're looking right now in our secondary methods course, what does that look like? How do you teach guitar? You know, not how do you play guitar. There's guitar classes for that. Yeah. But how do you teach it? How do you approach this? How do you teach an instrument of which you might not have any experience? And there's you know, so many students to where like music to them is not like your typical like band instrument or choir. It's like they want to learn how to play guitar. Exactly. So, uh, for instance, last Wednesday or two days ago, um, we we covered James Brown's Hot Pants. Tomorrow, um, spoiler alert, uh, we are going to be we're going to do Old Town Road by Lil Nas oh, X. That, that, I'm sure everyone's going to love it. Yeah, but. that'll go over really well, right? <laughs> and then we're going to do we'll do a couple others. I think we're going to do Chandelier. Uh, by Sia, we're going to and and we're going to try and put it all together, and we're going to play it as a class. But we've got a concert planned uh, in a couple weeks, so That's we're going to be exciting. playing playing outside as students are going to class. So yeah, it's been a busy two weeks, but it's been a great two weeks. It's been a fun two weeks, uh, and as you can tell, I get really passionate and I start talking oh, oh, a yeah. lot, and it, it's really exciting. Well, talking is what a podcast happening. is about. Absolutely. Um, I mean, last two weeks, like. Right? I was very grateful this last weekend there was no home football game, so that means no marching band craziness. So it was a nice opportunity to just kind of like sit at home, watch the game, get some stuff done, work on homework, practice, do all those good good things. Um, I was finally able to get my calendar put together for, for the year and 
feeling a little bit more organized and ready and just the year's rolling and I'm, I'm so excited. That uh, organization is key, isn't it? I, I know we talked about that last time, but um, uh, you know, right now, and I, I mentioned the, the modern band that we're doing in 512. Well, right now, the only place that we can store the instruments is in my office. So my office looks like a bomb has gone off in it oh. because, I mean, it's just a giant mess. And so for a person that has to have order and, you know, I need to know where I'm going to be, when I'm going to be there and everything has its place. It's, it's difficult. Let me tell you, like this, when you this don't have week it started up. like uh, beginning of the week, uh, I've been having some work done on my house, so I had to move everything out of my room upstairs. So it's just been a discombobulated mess. And I finally now have the clear to like move all my stuff down. And I, that's the first thing I want to do as soon as I have the opportunity to do so, just because I'm like, it's everywhere. Yeah, I know. We had a, well, we had that storm a couple of weeks ago and dumped uh, five and a half inches in the span of about yeah, two hours. My, my basement flooded. And, and our basement flooded. And so I just now have everything dried out. So I've got to stretch the carpet. And my, my daughter's wanting us to get that done as well. So. Well, let's let's move into theory, right? Everybody's favorite subject. All right, I can hear everyone collectively groaning right now. Um, in the future, when you're listening to this, ah, oh, music theory, man, that is, especially I, here when it's like at eight thirty class. Some mm-hmm. people don't like it very much. Well, I can tell you, <laughs> as a freshman, I had it at two o'clock in the afternoon, and when you take theory right after lunch, it doesn't work with the trip to fan, right? Time, so right? You, you eat a turkey sandwich and you come in and you're like, "Oh man, do we really have to talk about Neapolitan Six today?" Uh, but 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 seriously, um, music theory is something super important. There's kind of a lot of like uh, misconceptions about like music theory. Why do we need to do this or like? Am I ever really going to use this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, for for those that might be listening to this that uh, haven't decided whether you're going to be a music ed major yet, or if you are, um, you know, if you get a chance to take it in high school, take oh, it in high yeah. school. I mean, it's... I had a, I had a great experience. So, like, for me, uh, taking theory in high school, I, I got the basics down, which was great, but we also combined that with a handbell choir. So not only are you learning the basics of music theory, but you're, you're actually using the practical side of it right away. And I, I think that's probably one of my biggest pieces of advice is, and, and this is the way that I frame it for everyone. When you go to... Uh, our, our school systems have compartmentalized things so mm-hmm. much that you think, okay, it's time to go to English class. So you put your English class hat on and then you go, okay, it's time to go to math class. So you take your English hat off and you put your math hat on. Uh, well, I never wore my math hat very well. <laughs> well, not, a, lot of us <laughs> do, a lot of us don't, but the, the idea is that we don't live in a compartmentalized world, right? Everything we learn is to help us become a better member of society. It's the same way with theory, okay? How can, and, and so what I want to stress today uh, through this process is that theory is one piece of the pie of becoming a complete musician. Oh, yeah, especially just throughout your, starting off throughout your entire uh, undergraduate degree, you're going to be using uh, theory from... All the old old stuff to like all the contemporary uh, music theory, like in all of your courses, just starting out oral skills is, is something we're going to talk about much more in depth at a later episode. But knowing having your theory knowledge and oral skills makes dictation, makes sight singing um, much less t- of a complicated task to do because you have a better understanding. Music history, another thing that many of you are groaning about. But it's really cool to be able to see the development of how, like, we start off with um, Gregorian chant and then go through, like, Beethoven symphonies and everything in the development of theory. And, uh, well, if we, if we talk about history, too, there are so many great characters uh, throughout music history that uh, it makes them, their music come alive, which is fantastic. The other thing that I would add uh, with theory is that... Uh, the, the challenge to all of our listeners is how can you take 
one item, two items from every class that you go to, whether it's theory, history, and for today, we are going to focus just on theory. How can you take those concepts and apply them in your studio lessons? How can you take those concepts and apply them directly to ensemble rehearsals? Just because they, a conductor is not working with you at a specific moment doesn't mean that you can't apply those principles mm-hmm. moving forward. So as music educators, we need to be engaged in rehearsals by, well, let's listen, let's practice our oral skills, let's practice our theory identification skills, and let's think, if I were the conductor, what would I do in that situation? How would I address that? That's how we apply what we learn in theory. It's not just so that we can understand that a, a major scale is a set of whole steps and half steps. That's great and all, but how are you going to use yeah, that? It's taken, like the other day, uh, just in a rehearsal for a wind ensemble, it, it amazes me um, where I am in, in uh, my degree program and stuff of like things I now understand, like when sitting in a rehearsal and being like, oh, OK, so this is my place in this chord. So I need to adjust my pl- or adjust my volume or adjust my pitch to fit best into this to make this uh, leading tone go right to the tonic. Absolutely. And, you know, just your place in a chord. Are you the root? Are you the fifth? Are you the third? Are you the seventh? Because all of a sudden, um, it could change your fingering. It could change uh, your airspeed. It's going to change how how you're thinking about tuning. Because if you're the fifth of a chord, then all of a sudden, you know that you're going to have to play two cents sharp. You can't play right in the middle, otherwise the fifth Mm -hmm. isn't in tune. If you're playing the major third, you've got to be 13 cents flat. Well, all of a sudden, that may limit you on what you can do based on how your horn or your instrument is working that day. So you may have to use an alternate fingering. Yeah. Uh, and so there are a lot of things, but if we're not aware of where we're at or that there are different tunings within those chords or why chords sound the way they do, there's no way for us to be able to apply that theory. So that's why it's important. So theory is, is definitely when ensembles or your undergrad, you're going to be using this like every single day and then like uh, once you get out into the like quote unquote real world it's still going to be something you're going to use every day to help your students and you know exactly and when you work with your students as well the other side of that is we're we may not go into a middle school ensemble and say all right johnny i need you to play that d 13 cents flat well what we can say is all right now we're going to play a b flat and an f And then horns. Why don't you play this concert D? And you can call it concert D. You can call it an A. Whatever you want to call it. And say, play that for us. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to adjust. You can, you know, however you want them to adjust. Say, adjust until you hear the chord lock in. Okay? Now, that... There, we're not teaching them specifically what that content is, but if we didn't realize it, if we don't have that theory knowledge, we're not going to know to have them go through that process to develop the aural knowledge. And it all works together. It'll you make your life so much easier. Absolutely. And and if we try and th- put words to that and try and explain it to seventh graders, they're g- it, it, they're just going to be like, blah, blah, blah. It, it'll sound like Charlie Brown's teacher, <laughs> you know? And so... Part of that is understanding, okay, when is it time to experience versus when is it time to use, use that knowledge but he, or share that knowledge. Here's the deal. In order to be able to make that decision, you have to have a solid grasp of the topic, which mm-hmm. means theory is critical. Uh, whether it be through music reading, which, you know, theory one, we're typically dealing with lines and spaces and major scales and Oh, we haven't gotten to theory four with set set class theory, okay? And I love set theory. We could do a full session just on set theory because oh boy, I, we're we're getting pretty excited yeah, right here. Exactly, I I I love set theory, but theory one is just about those initial. Well, at some point we're going to have a beginning ensemble, whether that's beginning choir, beginning band, beginning orchestra. It doesn't matter. We have to understand how you learn it. In order to teach it. But if you don't have a solid understanding of theory, then you're not going to be able to teach it effectively. So that's why theory is so important. And that's why I always push our students to think about um, what, what we're learning, how we're learning it, 
And then next, how am I going to teach this? Yeah. How am I going to approach this with sixth graders? How do I how do I describe this in a way that twelve year olds are going to understand it? Because that's my job. My job is to work through as the teacher is to take something that is unknown and foreign to our students and put it into terms that they can understand so that they can come to a new understanding of what that topic is and hopefully a deep enough knowledge that they're able to turn around and teach it to their students. You can tell that this is definitely a topic that we're pretty passionate about and it, because it's all about helping your future students or helping your current students because uh, as music ed majors, that's that's kind of the, the end game. And like, there's, there's a lot of people who I've talked to who are like, oh man, music theory is really boring and stuff like that. There's just not a lot of two, but theory is a foundational concept for everything you're going to do in music. We've talked a lot about playing in your ensemble, how it's so much more enjoyable when you have that knowledge. Or like, for those of you who want to compose, mm-hmm. music theory is essential to and you ever wanting to compose and understand what you're doing. And, and I, I also think it, theory helps you to share and talk about what you're, what you're doing. Um, you know, you would be able to, whenever I work with um, uh, music appreciation students, um, one of the things that, that I find is, is that it's hard to describe music. It's hard to put into words what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're hearing. And outside of typically we would listen to something and I would say, what did you like about that? And one of the most common responses was, well, it's got a good beat. Well, what does that yeah, mean? Well, why does it have a good right, beat? Right. Why does it have a good beat? What does that mean? Why, why, are, you, why, are, you impact, why is it impacting you like that? You know, and in some cases they would say, well, it's really up tempo and the quarter note would be about 65 beats per minute. And then there would be other times they're like, man, this song is such a drag. It's so slow. It's boring. And it would be like quarter note equals like 156. You know, so like in internally, I'm sitting there going, well, wait a second. There's a disconnect here. Mm-hmm. So uh, for me, the, the theory part of it isn't, uh, isn't boring, right? It, it's a way to be able to describe what they hear. And so we would go through all these activities of trying to describe, you know, why do we like music? Why, why, why is it that this sounds great to us? So when it gets to composing, instead of saying, well, why did you do that? Then the person coming, because somebody that nowadays can just go to GarageBand and create their own grooves, they really don't need an understanding of how those chords Mm -hmm. are working. They just know that they like it. But the problem is that gap is that they can't describe it. Yeah. All right. So now at this point, then, then you might say, well, if they can just do it in GarageBand, why do we need theory at all? Great question. I'm glad you thought of that because here, here's the reason is because if they're going in and they're creating it, then we, we want this is an entree for them to to compose and then they compose and then we ask them, well, why did you make that decision? And we can start asking them questions. And then what does that do? That reveals those areas where now as a teacher, I'm assessing, okay, what do they know about music? And why are they making these decisions? Now that helps me design as a teacher. I can say, okay, here are the gaps in their knowledge. Let's do a little bit more work here. So then we have them bring their compositions back and we say, okay, now let's see if we can fine tune this a little bit by addressing this. And they're like, ooh, well, what's that topic? Then I show them and then I can show them in whether it's GarageBand or Sibelius or whatever we're using. Mm -hmm. I can show them the tools to continue to tweak it. Now, all of a sudden, they're able to talk about chord progressions. They're able to talk about, well, I've heard this chord progression in this piece, this piece, and this piece. And I really like the way they did the bridge on this piece. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it into my song. Now they're using the word bridge. Now they're using the word progression. Mm-hmm. Now, we still haven't gotten to the point where they c- could actually write it out yet, but we're getting there. Yeah, it, it's all about setting up those building blocks for the students who, once again, might not be going through the traditional route of band or choir music to, like, allowing them to access music in a fun way. Uh, but going on here, um, we're going to go ahead. We're going to take a short break. Then after the break, we're going to have uh, our guest, uh, Dr. Morris, come and join us. See you in a bit. See you in a bit.
Welcome back to Not Your Forte Podcast. Here we're going to welcome our very first guest on the podcast. I'm excited. It's going to be so much fun. Um, oh. Dr. Alyssa Morris like talking. here at Kansas State University. She teaches oboe. She teaches theory. does a whole lot of things. Um, Dr. Morris, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, as I, I am an oboist and a composer, um, this is my third year here at K-State. Um and I really appreciate the opportunity that this particular job merges several things that I really love. Um, I get to teach music theory here. I teach music theory three and aural skills two, and I teach all of the oboe students. And so, and we have this huge research area, which is really great about the job, which means that, um, that we pretty much get to define what particular to us is our research and and so for one person it might be music history for another person it might be music business and in my case I'm especially interested in composition and in the beginning it started out for oboe because I knew that if I composed something for oboe I could find somebody who would perform it myself so <laughs> I don't have to bring anybody else into doing it but the more that I've um, entered into the kind of the composition field uh, opportunities and doors have opened to start composing for other musicians who are also willing, thankfully, to play my work. <laughs> and so um, it's a really great job because it has so much variety. So I guess I should take you back a little bit to how I started and why I'm doing these different things. And uh, when I first started um, music, I guess. I was five and I was begging my parents for piano lessons. I was kind of plunking out Mary Had a Little Lamb and Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on the piano and and they said, well, we'll give you piano lessons if you promise that you'll practice. And I said, I promise I'll practice every day. <laughs> and I don't know if I did every day, but most days I practiced and, and I really fell in love with the piano. Um, then they found early on that I especially gravitated towards improvisation that, it, that I would want to steal my practice time for improvising and they would come in the room and find I was making up stuff that wasn't necessarily the song. <laughs> and so they said that you can do that if you make sure that the first so-and-so minutes of your practice, that most of it is spent doing the stuff that your teacher has asked you. And then if you do that, you can use improvisation as a treat and you can do it at the very end and spend maybe 10 minutes or so improvising. And so that was something that I looked forward to every one of my practices and would. And I also appreciate that they understood the value of learning the basics of learning music by really fantastic composers that already exist because as you do so it, it informs your ear it informs it teaches you about form it teaches you about chord progressions and and all of those sorts of things that you don't know that you're learning but that you're learning because you're you're hearing it over and over and you're playing it and so the next level is studying and it, and it makes it click so much quicker because you have already been immersed in it and so um in about seventh grade it, that's in utah when we started band we're so lucky here in kansas to be doing it in fifth grade <laughs> awesome i was a seventh grade student as well yeah and so it just feels like even though the learning was accelerated yeah it was still like you were always behind those other districts that started yes a yeah, bit been bit playing my horn since fifth grade that's really really <laughs> lucky it's so lucky so I started in seventh grade and I went to my band teacher for the orientation day thinking that I would either play the flute or the clarinet. And he said, well, have you thought about the oboe? And I said, what's an oboe? <laughs> and so <laughs> show me an oboe. And that's how I got started. I didn't really know what I was getting into. I had no idea I was going to be making reads for the rest of my life. But all right, <laughs> that's okay. Um, but um, I fell in love with it right away, and I don't know if it would have made a difference if it was another instrument, whatever they started me on. I think I just loved music so much that it, I would have fallen in love with it no matter what. Because when I go to an orchestra concert, I'm thinking, gee, I wish I played the horn because listen to what they get to play in Mahler. Or gee, I wish I played the per I wish I played percussion because listen to that really cool lick and you know and the drummer does the coolest stuff of all of them or you know, I wish I played the violin because you can't beat some of their mel melodic lines that they get to do but then I you know but then I'm always grateful for 
when I play the oboe, when we get to play the really sad lines in music and make everybody cry, and, and, you know. <laughs> so anyway, there there are so many great instruments. They're all great, and and I think I would have been happy doing any, but I'm really grateful that he started me on oboe because there have been so many opportunities that arose because I started. So I was interested in oboe, I was interested in piano still, and I was still interested in composition because my improvisation led to composition and I would enter these reflections competitions that they had in our elementary school and junior high and high school that were little they were arts competitions so some people submitted visual arts or photography or you know sculpture or stories and some submitted um, compositions and so um, I had a reasonable amount of success in these competitions and it really fueled the fire to want to keep on doing this and and so by the time I was in my um, in high school, um, playing oboe and band and still doing a lot of piano. My piano teacher would encourage me to give some solo recitals. And, and so he, I was learning great music like Chopin and stuff like that with my, with my piano teacher. But my band teacher was so encouraging of my composition. And he told me that, you know, I was working on this band piece. And he said, well, if you write it, we'll play it. So he had our high school band play this band piece that I wrote and it was a really really special experience and it it is uh, sort of a I just feel forever grateful for a fantastic music educator I mean so many fantastic music educators that molded my um, experience in the past I mean he had me over at his house working with Finale because what I had before was Cakewalk and it was a kind of a, a system that was more geared toward like rock and pop and and I was trying to do the writing on that software system and he said well you've really got to start learning Finale or Sibelius or something and and so he taught me how to do that I came over to his house many times worked and worked on that with his family probably having family dinner and whatever and here I was plugging away at Sibelius and, or Finale and and they played the piece and it was just really, I felt like it went really well and it was really exciting to me to be able to have all of these like areas of, of interest in music merge. And um, so when I went to college, I started my undergraduate degree at Brigham Young University and I auditioned on piano I auditioned on oboe and I kind of um I we wouldn't declare composition until maybe our second year if we had decided that we wanted to go composition but I was taking many composition classes my first semester too and I I got a scholarship on oboe and I was on the waiting list in piano so that was an easy <laughs> that was how I decided pretty much that I was going to do oboe I loved oboe and I loved piano but that money always helps. So um, so I started in oboe and um, started taking these composition classes. And, and I love taking the composition classes, but ultimately settled on doing oboe performance and continuing to take these composition classes. And um, I took uh, songwriting classes. I took composition classes that were more geared towards like serial and beyond, like really new music. I took, I mean, I didn't know that that's what I was getting into. And then, and then one of our assignments was bring some appliance in and you're going to create a composition with the appliance. <laughs> and I thought, I don't is this composition? But it challenged what I understood was composition. What appliance really did you bring? Yeah, yeah. I wanna, I'm alarm curious about clock. an alarm, alarm clock. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> My hope was that it would beep at the right time. <laughs> it never quite worked. But um, so, and somebody else had a bike in there, and they were just hitting the spokes on their bike, and, and it did challenge what I thought was composition in a good way because it made my mind kind of you know expand. And, um, and so, but I did my degree in oboe performance, and by the time I got to my senior recital, I had a fantastically supportive um, oboe teacher. Her name is Gerilyn Giovanetti, and uh, when I got to my senior recital, I asked her, Gerilyn, how would you feel about me writing a piece that I would play at my senior recital? And she said, sure, why not? And so I wrote this piece, it's called Four Personalities, and um, for oboe and piano, and now we have the Briggs Meyer tests for personalities and we have the what are some of the other tests but the the test that you have a lot of personality inventories yeah. and just depending on what they're trying to determine and determine but what we had then the big one was the Hartman personality test and so I based it off of the Hartman personality test and each movement 
kind of depicted a different personality and they are based on colors too. So we have yellow and then white and blue and red. And so um, anyway, I presented this piece to her and she was really like happy with it, excited about it. And she said, well, I mean, I, all I was thinking is, why don't I just play this at my senior recital? I was so nearsighted. I, I didn't know that there was more that you could do with it after that. I was like, I know people polish things, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know about how to get stuff performed on conventions or anything like that. And, but um, she said, well, why don't we send this to Trevco Music Publishing and see what Trevor Kramer thinks. And why don't we send it to Nancy Ambrose King, who is the, um, she's the professor at University of Michigan. She's the oboe professor there. And then she was the IDRS president. That's our Double Reed Society, our international society. And, and so I said, okay, well, let's try it out and send it to them and see what they think. And, and I sent it to Dr. King and she decided she wanted to perform it at the IDRS convention that was gonna happen in 2008, just after, which I was like floored by, so excited. And then I would, and then I sent it to Trevco and he decided he wanted to publish it. And so it just, I was so grateful for, again, a fantastic music educator who had a vision of what could be done and with what I had, you know, and then, helped me to know the direction that I could go. And really that was the door, the open door kind of that led to other composition opportunities. And since then I've been grateful to continue to re receive commissions to compose for, started out being mostly double read players, but now I'm, I just finished a, a work last year for the Richmond Symphony in Indiana and um, that I wrote for them. It's a it's a symphonic work, so it was my first symphonic commission. And then we submitted to a competition just called the Barlow Endowment. And um, we wanted to see if we could win this award to compose, for me to compose a cello concerto for cellist Andres Diaz from Southern Methodist University and then the Richmond Symphony and I just found out in August that I will get to do that. Congratulations. So, yeah, I'm really, really excited. But, um, and also I just, I just finished a CD um, through MSR Classics that's all me performing my own music, which I was really excited about because I feel like then it merges everything that I love into one lump, you know? Um, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't sound like a lump, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it, but um, you know the composition process for sure the keyboard process because many of the parts are are keyboard you know and then the and oboe you know my love and what I do most of the time and and so um, yeah I just feel really grateful that all of those things can come together in this way so that's a little bit about me maybe more than you wanted. So I, I'm no I think that's a great segue because one of the one of the topics that I was covering before. Uh, you joined us was that a lot of times in our own schooling um, we have this tendency to become compartmentalized so we go from class to class we don't really look at how it all intertwines and how we apply that on a daily basis and so talk about it because I, I have these moments of clarity like when I sit down uh, to kind of give you an idea uh, I was at a conference last last weekend and the, one of the keynote speakers was my seventh grade band director, Aww. you know? And so you sit there and I'm listening to him and I'm like, I didn't realize I picked that up from him. Oh my gosh. You know? So you start to see how so many moments like converge in your life. So, and, and these moments of clarity pop up. And so do you, when did you realize that all of these, your, your piano, your theory, and how they all really fit together in what you were doing on a daily basis, whether that be sitting in wind ensemble or orchestra rehearsal or theory class. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I was confused especially about it as I entered into my undergraduate degree because I had a balance of these things in high school. I was doing composition competitions and I was doing, I was playing a piano and oboe competitions and, and then very involved in all of them. And, and they all had a special part of my life, but then I had to choose when I came to declare a major, I had to choose what it was going to be that I was going to do. And I felt so overwhelmed by that because I thought, well, I don't want to let go of these things that are really important to me. They, I feel like 
where they merge is where some really unique research can happen and, and really unique things can happen. And, and that I also feel like my, I, my composition is better because of oboe or my oboe is better because of the piano or they're all better for each other because of each other. And so I struggled with it for a couple of years, but then when I remembered to, to try to make time for it, it, it was when really amazing things started happening. And I think it, I was still trying to figure it out after my, after I graduated with my undergraduate degree and I had about a five year break in between my undergraduate degree and my master's degree, my um, two children were born then, my 11-year-old um, Campbell and my 10-year-old Audrey. And, and um, so some of that time was just I had little ones, you know, and so I was trying to keep tiny humans alive and happy, <laughs> you know. And, and, uh, and also, but being sort of not in school, I had to figure out how this was all going to fit. I was starting to receive commissions. I was, I was teaching oboe students and piano students out of my home. I was performing in some groups, some uh, like professional, semi-professional groups. And, and, um, and so I kind of had to start piecing together a, a career, you know, and figure out yeah. what I wanted it to look like. And I'm really glad that I had that time because it helped me know what I really wanted to do when I entered back into my master's degree. And by then, I had it figured out. I knew that I wanted to be an oboist, that I wanted to compose, that I would use my piano every day in accompanying students and in, in working with theory students or whatever. But that was the vision that I had that I, I really, you know, wanted to pursue. And, um, but it, it took some time because there, there's kind of a, sometimes we think, I don't think that any teacher ever wants to make us feel this way. Like there are any any program makes us want, wants to make us feel this way, that there's one particular outcome to what you will do. But sometimes when we come into a program and we think, well, we come in and we go out and we do this, you know. But um, I think that, uh, that we want the autonomy of a student, that we want them to be able to discover what their unique way of going about doing this is going to be because they have something unique to offer that and another student has it something unique to offer everybody has something unique to offer and our hope is that within a wonderful system that's already been created they can they can use their autonomy and their unique um perspectives and the things that they're all interested in and have those things come together to help them to become the best music educator that they can be, to help them to become the best um, performer that they can be or composer or whatever they're going to be. And so um, the hope is that, I mean, that students start making those connections and realize that that's what we want for them. We want to help them to be able to to find that. But sometimes it takes some time because we see, you know, the, the program laid out in front of us. I take this class, this class, this class, this class, this class. And, and um, but within all of that, you know, then there's your individuality. What are you going to do with it? And what are, what are how are you going to incorporate the things that you're passionate about in this music education project? Or it's absolutely fantastic uh, that you're just talking about this. Last week we talked a lot about like you you know you best and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I found in, in my experience, music education is not a linear path. Yeah. And when you when you come to be a teacher, you you need to be yourself. You need to. Then there's so many unique things that you can put it in. You can't. It's not a square mold all the time and stuff like well, that. Well, and I, I also think that the the path isn't written, you know, and so you have to be open to twists and turns. And so there are a couple nuggets that I want to just draw out real quick for our listeners. Number one, your experiences uh, before going into your masters. You know, so that gap. You know, a lot of students ask, should I go straight in and work on my, my master's? And my, my response always is, you have to go out and experience life and experience the music profession to know what questions you're going to ask. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> like you said, you knew you wanted to go get a master's and you knew this is the path that you wanted to go. 
And I think having time to experience that is really important and knowing what questions to ask because we don't know where that path is going to lead us. And and so it's really important there. I think the other part of it, and I was talking with high school seniors today, and that is approaching this profession with a level of creativity. Is I mean, you, that, can't, you can't take creativity out of music. Right. So many people try. Well, and it's like you have to think about this um, uh, as as open ended and thinking outside of the box. Because if we if we think if we begin to look at it as a factory worker and we are creating a product, that's where it becomes stale and doesn't really stay relevant to what our society That's where you needs. get the burnout yeah. too. Right. And I yes. think, I think burnout. And so we have to think about this since this is for future music educators. I think part of this is keeping in mind, what kind of teacher do you want to be and how are you going to foster that creativity in your own students? Mm-hmm. Because, I, I know you. the way that you describe some of your teachers is the same way that I describe mine. And I think oh, yeah. it would be a fascinating study to look at the people that choose to go into the profession, whether that's performing, education, composition. They all have, at, at critical points in their development, people that w- are willing to be there to support them in taking risks. Yeah. Um, my, my piano teacher... What I mean, she was amazing because she dealt with me, you know, (laughs) I would walk in and I'd be like, I really don't want to play this today. You know, like I I would be doing Chopin. I'd be doing Beethoven. I'd be like, but, you know, I really want to do some Billy Joel. And she was like, really? And I'm like, yeah. Have you not heard River of Dreams? I mean, that piano solo is pretty sweet. I'd like to learn it. And she was like. Okay, I tell you what. And it was kind of that same deal, you know, so yeah. you can get out there and play. And, and, and so having those moments where they let you take those risks, that's huge. And, and I think that's probably the third point um, behind uh, being open to any path, keeping creativity alive. I think that third area is knowing your passions and following those, and don't don't let a a curriculum plan deter you though from those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Always always find something and an avenue that you really enjoy. Anyways, right before we get into kind of the meat of talking about some theory, I got a quick question for you. Is like during uh, college, what what was your favorite class in, in college during your undergrad? Well, I should say oboe, and I did <laughs> really really love oboe, and I knew I was going to. My teacher was amazing. She was so fantastic. But the surprise class that I didn't know was going to be my favorite class was songwriting. You were talking about Billy Joel and and playing Billy Joel and how you just wanted like that outlet. And this was an outlet class if I ever knew one. Not that it was like a freebie class. We had to work hard in this class, but I took three semesters of songwriting and then another semester of um, just private lessons because I enjoyed it so much. In our advanced songwriting class, We had a requirement of how many songs we were supposed to write in a semester. It was like six or something like that. And then we would get to class and he would say, who's got a song? Who's ready to perform? And we'd perform our song. We'd analyze the song, talk about what form it was. Was it AABA? Was it ABABCB? Was it, you know, and and what different devices we were using or sort of um, a literary devices too that we were using in our lyrics. And, and it was so enjoyable just to learn from other people by hearing them and their creative works and then also having the opportunity to be able to perform my own and, and grow in, in that area. It was so much fun. That's really exciting. That's awesome. Anyways. And, well, no, and I mean, through all of that, I mean, one of the things I would say is what I'm noticing, because we're, we're starting on that same process with in, in our secondary methods course now. So I may, I may uh, avoid talking about it too much during the podcast, but I'd love to pick your brain on... You know, because a lot of times those songwriters, they they have these songs in their heads, but it's hard for them to realize it, whether it be they don't have the instrumentation, they don't play yeah. the instruments that they hear in their head. Right. So I think finding opportunities, too, se- would seem to be one of those moments when you're teaching that class to, yeah. to be able to, because there's a moment of clarity that happens whenever you hear it for the first time, you're like... Oh, that's, that's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like. That's so cool. Yeah. My my favorite class was actually a combination of classes. 
Uh, and this is when it crystallized for me as a music education major overall and the importance of not compartmentalizing. And that was I took world history, music history, and art history all in the same semester. And it, it all came to a head about six weeks in and we landed um, in the late 18th century together and then the rest of the semester just moved in concert. So I would go to, um, and, and at that point, as a trombone player, I was playing um, some of those uh, 19th century Paris Conservatory solos and, and, and working my way through the lit that way. And so there was this moment where I'm, in, I, I'm studying some of those Paris Conservatory solos. But then in world history, we're talking about... Uh, early 19th century. So we're talking right post uh, French Revolution. So we're seeing what's happening in Europe. We're seeing what's happening in the United States. We're seeing what everything that's going on. Then I would pick up and I would go to art history and I would see how that would be reflected in uh, color, in approaches, in types of uh, media that they were using. And then I would go to my next class, which was music history and what, how all of the world's issues and the art movements and how they were all moving together and impacting what was going on in the music and why we got what we got. And I realized I only have to study for one class yeah. because everything was so interdependent mm-hmm. on what we do uh, in life. And, and at that point, I was like, it made complete sense. And I was like, oh, I get it now. And so at that point, it's like, OK, well, what can I do in, you know, uh, how does what do I do in theory impact what I'm doing in jazz ensemble, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then if I, if I'm thinking about in in jazz B, if I'm playing piano, the chord choices that I have are impacting what the soloist is playing and so on and so forth. And these conversations that happen through the music, uh, you know, and we talked a little bit earlier, my, uh, you know, how does theory impact how I listen within a rehearsal and how I'm reacting to what else is going on around me? And so that was the moment for me when it when it finally clicked. Awesome. That's awesome. Awesome. Anyway, so we've been talking a little bit about music theory before you uh, stop by and everything. What are what are some struggles that you see your students deal with on a regular? Like, what are some common struggles that you see happen? Well, if they come in and think that this is, I, maybe I felt this way with math before, that I was only seeing the numbers and not what it meant or how it applied or why it was important. And so if they come in only seeing the part writing, we have to go from a five, a five to a five to a one, right? Or we have to um, create this uh, Neapolitan chord. And um if they only see that part of it, I could understand why it would be frustrating because it just feels like notes on a page, right? But um, I feel like when when they understand that their favorite Billy Joel music or the music of the Beatles or John Williams or or um, Beethoven or um, you know Miles Davis, anybody that they are all using secondary dominance and that they're all using Neapolitan chords and that this is something that they're doing to make the music colorful. I think when they start to understand that, that's helpful. And then when they also start understanding when they're, and I try to help my students with this or when I go and teach a master class somewhere, I try to help students with this when we're, pl- when we're playing oboe and trying to decide how to phrase something. I want to make sure they understand the impact points with the theory. Like if we're moving from a five to a one right here, there is something significant that's got to happen dynamically too to say five, one. And so, um, or if we get to a really interesting chord, like a Neapolitan chord or an augmented sixth chord or something like that, there's we're probably going to want to change our color or change our approach and leading to that particular chord. I think when they understand that it's all going to help them to be able to um, not only learn to perform their music better, but also conduct a group better. Because if I understood that and I was looking at a score and conducting a band that this is, you know, 5-1, it also would help me to decipher who, like, if I'm not hearing 
a major chord right here. You know, if something's fishy, then you know I need to make sure that I'm I'm checking the different instruments to, yeah. to see what's going on. So. And and that impacts their movement as well, like the gestures that you're going to use and the, and who to make eye contact with when yes. you know there there's specific. I I think of I think it's the Barry Sachs part in. Um, Lincoln Sherposy in the first movement in Lisbon, and there's a two three resolution, right? So, mm -hmm. you and it, it always reminded me. I don't know if you get this, but do you remember the CBS Evening News? Not very well. Okay, so CBS Evening News had the, had the same resolution. Uh -huh. This is the, where Doctor uh, Payne's dating himself. Oh, that's exactly right. So <laughs> CBS Evening News, you listen to their theme, and the very last was was, was a two three resolution. So they, they've got this nice little uh, suspension going on, and it resolves from the two to the three rather than the four to the three. And the same thing happens at the end of Lisbon, and I and that Barry Sax part. I'm like, you know, so as a conductor, you know. Where where to look? You yeah. know who to who to have that conversation with, and how you're going to. Because I'll never forget my my conducting professor, uh, in my uh, doctoral studies. Um, you know, one of his favorite things uh, was having me sing every line, mm -hmm. and being able to sing those lines, understanding those impact points, because you don't know how to sing them if you don't know how everything is organized. Mm -hmm. And so being able to look at that score and be able to sing. And so I'll, like I'll go into lessons and he would be like, all right, clarinet three, go. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, you know. And, and as any band director will tell you, clarinet three is the most important part in right. any ensemble. You know, and, and so at that point, if you know how to shape, you know, it's going to help you as a conductor to be able to not only identify it, but then the gestures and how to teach. Um, because you've got to know, well, if they're, if they're playing that wrong, how do we, how do we make the adjustments? And I mean, and that's even for performers, you know, uh, if, if they're, if they're playing something, you know, and they either don't recognize it or if they do recognize it, but don't know how to fix it, yep. you know, that, that, that opens us up for a lot of conversations that we can have. There's a lot of conversation that we have about in pre in lessons about where are you going right here? Mm -hmm. This phrase, where is it going? Always got to be going somewhere. It's always got to be going somewhere. But the reason that we understand that it's going somewhere, even if it's unaccompanied, we were dealing with an unaccompanied piece today at 9.30. And, and um, those still are, they have harmony that is traveling underneath them, you know? And so, and the things that you're doing in the line to find the harmony and it is going, it's always going somewhere each phrase. And so if we know the destination points of where we're going, that really helps to help a student or help yourself if you're learning it to know how to shape. That's really cool. Um, do you, so there's a lot of, I think, resources available that students don't know about and to uh, like help them out with theory, uh, like, what are some kind of resources in which you know that students could easily access? Well, the internet's pretty cool because I think, I'm going to date myself too, but I mean, we were using the internet when I was in undergraduate, but I wouldn't have gone on to musictheory.net or something like that. We didn't do any of that stuff. We just had the book and we just opened the book and, and we tried to do our best to study out of the book and ask teachers and stuff, which were super good resources. And I think all of your teachers want to help. So if you're in music theory and you have questions, I'm sure your teacher will want to meet outside of class with you and make sure that you understand what's going on. But if you are, I mean, something like oral skills takes some homework, right? It takes, I mean, music theory takes homework too, but oral skills takes some practice and mm -hmm. you're spending a yep. lot of time with you know plunking chords on the piano or finding a good resource finding a buddy that you can practice with um or finding a good resource like musictheory.net and you talked about peoria too that's a really good resource teoria teoria, teoria. that's yeah. right mm -hmm. i don't use that one quite as much but i use musictheory.net a lot i have um for our different in in aural skills when we are working on uh, just intervals, you know, up to an octave. I've created a musictheory.net that they do for a couple of different times, and their goal is to get at least 20 correct in a row. And and then um, they ha well, I have one that introduces major, minor, diminished, and augmented chords, and they do the same thing. They'll try to get 20 in a row correct. And, and um, 
So those kinds of resources are really great. You can go on to the website and you can build your own, basically. And I think that they also have, you know, music theory quiz questions mm -hmm. for you, too. Um, and especially important on any of these websites is going to be, I was just talking to my husband about this. He's also a music educator, and, and he was asking me about the kinds of things that these students need to know before they go on to take to be a music major. I said, well, if they could know their scales and know the keys. You know, if they understand what all of the different keys in major and minor are. That was so them, helpful that my, my band director took time to teach us, like, all of our scales and stuff like that. When I got to theory, I'm like, okay, this... And, Excellent. and maybe that's a maybe that's a conversation too for another podcast is what are the strategies for learning there are so many different ways that you can you can explore uh tonality so and and keyality or however you want to look mm -hmm. at that in terms of learning your major scales your minor scales uh because i'll never forget I mean, my my trombone uh all of my trombone professors were basically all like if you tie them all back go all the way back to, uh, in my doctoral study, his uh, teacher was Emory Remington at uh, the uh, Eastman School of Music. And there, I mean, it was to a point where we learned all of our modes, all of our scales, everything, and just, and the ability to work through that orally is, is huge. And one of the things, and, and so I think that might be a topic for us to be able to look at what are what are the different um, approaches, strategies for learning, uh, key signatures, uh, because I mean that's a huge thing I would think within oral skills as well is because yeah. you know is something major or minor and what what are the telltale signs and then at that point um, you know one of the bigger hindrances then is the use of solfege. Mm -hmm. And there are so many. Right, we'll talk about that. Plenty. Yeah, we'll once we're, once absolutely. We get more in depth on oral skills. Slash hindrance. Oh, well, so well, and and well, and the only reason I I mentioned hindrance first is because there's a there's a level of where the the actual terminology becomes a hurdle because yes. we think more of the terminology rather than the actual. Uh, uh, melody or uh, melodic movement itself, right. which then if we're worried about, and so it's like that, that sequencing. And so the way, the way I always like to frame it for our students when, when I'm talking in beginning band methods, as I say, you know, part of our charge as teachers is to get students to uh, bring meaning to what they're seeing as opposed to going on a treasure hunt and trying to extract meaning from what they see. Mm -hmm. Because if they, go, looking at it, go in knowing what it's going to sound like or have a really good idea of what it's going to sound like, they're going to be much more accurate in pitch. They're going to be much more accurate on fingerings because they're not thinking about all of, And so, I mean, and I'm a huge proponent of... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, solfege and using that especially to develop the ear because once when you go through that process and you start with uh, what I call nonsense syllables and you just start by developing the lines and then you add that that solfege in you are attaching sounds to that and so the minute you have that you can tell key function very, very quickly based on what solfege that you're using. And it's r super, super helpful. And it's um, a really good tool to tie it back to music theory, too. Mm -hmm. Especially because I try to, when I'm working with students on solfege, I mean, sometimes we ask, what was the hardest thing about this particular example? They'll say so solfege. Solfege, <laughs> I know. It totally <laughs> was. It was a mouthful, wasn't it? And um, actually, today we had transcriptions. If we have students transcribe, and if they're vocalists, they, they do the transcription, and it was for a musical today, and this student did Burn from Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <laughs> And she did it in solfege, and her solfege was so good. It was awesome. I was just wowed by it, and she had obviously worked really hard, and the thing never went to do. It was actually on te a lot, and she was totally correct, too. It was on te. It hardly went to do. Um, but I try to teach anchor pitches do and soul and if you have to do some flabber jabber in the middle you know whatever you're saying <laughs> uh, that's the technical like that, term right <laughs> <laughs> then that's fine but if you can keep do in your mind and if you can keep soul in your mind then 
you're going to be much more likely for one to pass a proficiency. That's not what yeah. it's all about. The, the what it's about is getting our ear better, right? Learning. But <laughs> but being able to keep track of dough helps you to internalize what key was this really in from beginning to end, and um, and do and soul help that to happen. So if students are singing any syllables, be like, sing the do, sing the soul, you know, so that they make sure. Plus, mm -hmm. that five to one relationship in theory is so crucial and so important that if they're using those as the anchor pitches, it's also going to help them learn to apply it to theory a little bit better, too. All so, right. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and yeah, like I said, being the you. first guest on our podcast. Uh, she mentioned she she's a composer. Uh, where 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 can we find your compositions or your CD and stuff like that? If we're wanting to look for that. Sure. Um, well, my website is alyssamorrismusic.com, and it's a little outdated. I need to update it, so <laughs> forgive some of that. But if you're looking for my CD, um, the CD that I just released um, is called A Higher Place. It's through MR MSR Classics, and it's available on Amazon and iTunes. And MSR also sells at MSR Classics and Google Play and Spotify, whatever. And then um, and I'm trying to think what else. Some YouTube. I have a, a couple of other compositions that other people have have. Um, recorded that you could probably find if you search Alyssa Morrison music or compositions on YouTube. So that would give you an idea. So definitely uh, check that out for some fun oboe music or some great uh, compositions. I can vouch that Dr. Morris is an absolutely phenomenal oboist. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, kind of wrapping up now, uh, we still have our composition contest. Uh, just to remind you, uh, it's 15 to 20 second comp composition for our intro and outro music um really we're looking for anything you'd be wanting to submit and our winner will uh, be selected by dr Payne and i and you will get a 20 dollars chick-fil-a gift card so just make sure to send that to our email um at not your forte podcast at gmail.com uh, be sure to uh, check us out on all of our social media platforms. We're, we're on Facebook at Not Your Forte Podcast, uh, Twitter um, at Not Your Forte Pod, uh, Instagram, once again, Not Your Forte Podcast. Um, ton, tons of resources to uh, be able to check us out. And I think now um, we're growing a little bit. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on Google Podcasts, pretty much anywhere you could think to find a podcast. Share with your friends, get get it out there. We'd love to uh, have a have a wide, wide net as we share these uh, strategies, ideas, and ways to just navigate the minefield of uh, being a music ed major uh, in the 21st century. And uh, be on, uh, on the lookout on our uh, YouTube account, uh, Not Your Forte Podcast. Uh, we'll be starting a weekly series to where I'll be uh, interviewing uh, students from freshmen to seniors, asking them some questions about how their music education experience, and we're going to uh, do what all of our studio professors do, and we're going to be in the practice room a little bit more for those interviews. Um, once again, uh, just go ahead, if you can, rate five stars, uh, subscribe to our podcast or, or, or whatever you're looking at, and uh, this has been Not Your Forte, and thanks for listening. See you in two weeks.